I'm an economic forecaster. I, part of my job is to predict the future. I'm often wrong about those predictions, so I try to be, uh, uh, I try to acknowledge the, the uncertainty in these forecasts. But uh, let me talk you through my thought process about how the trade war is working right now uh, and so, and how we put together a, a forecast for how it's going to affect the U.S. economy going forward. Um, so this is, uh, the, the trade war for macroeconomists and for uh, investment strategists and, and business executives, it's, it's really the, the, I'd say the, the highest top of mind issue for, uh, for all of these people um, in 2019. Uh, and it's because the trade war, even if it doesn't affect uh, a business directly, like the construction industry, a lot of construction companies uh, are they're not global businesses, but they are, uh, those companies are going to be affected if there's a recession in the United States. Uh, and uh, the consensus of uh, basically every economist in the United States, except for Peter Navarro, who's one of President Trump's advisors, is that uh, trade wars do increase the risks of, of uh, an economic recession. Um, and so uh, what I have been spending my, a lot of my year on is uh, analyzing how the trade war is affecting the U.S. economy uh, and using the data that we have in hand for what's already happened to the U.S. economy uh, as a result of, of the trade war and tariffs uh, to look at as what, what, is, what is likely to happen going forward. So um, this is the, the change in effective tariff rates uh, on uh, U.S. imports from China uh, and U.S. exports to China uh, that we've had uh, since the beginning of 2018. Um, tariffs are like, so that you have a 6% sales tax in Michigan, you buy something for $100, you pay $6 in tax to the, to the state government. Tariffs, the same idea, you, you buy $100 worth of things from a foreign country, you pay uh, the tariff to the U.S. government uh, as, a, as a sales tax on those uh, purchases of foreign goods. And the effective tariff rate on our, um, what Americans buy from China has gone up from about 3% uh, a, a year and a half ago to uh, now it's um, over 20% and it's approaching 25%. So that's a pretty big um, increase in taxes in the short term. Uh, there, there are kind of two ways of thinking about this tax increase and what it means for the U.S. economic outlook. So um, if you take in Who's taking kind of a macroeconomics class or an intro to something related to macro in the room? A couple of, all right, good, a couple of folks. So uh, the, um, if you think of all the demand in the U.S. economy, the spending power of American consumers, the amount of money that businesses are going to invest in, uh, in growing their business in, over the course of a year, uh, and the spending of the government on, uh, on public services, and you add it up, and that's domestic demand in the U.S. Uh, if you impose, you raise a tax rate, then that means that there's less spending power left over by either by American consumers or American businesses to spend in the private uh, to spend in the private sector. And tariffs are the same way; they're a, a tax increase, and the aggregate tax increase from this uh, this increase in tariffs is, uh, I think, around the order of uh, between a quarter and half a percentage point of U.S. GDP. So that means you're, you're shrinking that, pot, that pie of economic activity that, that can be, that pie of economic demand that's going to increase, that's going to fuel spending in the U.S. Um, and that would will, that will be a modest drag on U.S. economic activity over time if that was sort of just the only effect. The other effect of, uh, of tariffs on the U.S. economy uh, is the effect on business sentiment. And we've seen, uh, this is, I, I promise this is the most obscure thing I'm going to show you tonight. So the, this is the, um, the yield curve, that, which is the, um, uh, you know, typically if, if a business wants to borrow for five years, the interest rate's higher than if the business wants to borrow for five months. And longer term interest rates are usually higher than short term interest rates. It's true for businesses, it's true for consumers, uh, and it's true for the government as well. And this is comparing uh, the difference between the interest rate that the government pays to borrow for 10 years uh, to the interest rate that the government pays to borrow for three months. Uh, and this is used by macroeconomists and, and financial market analysts as a, an economic indicator for the United States. The reason is, if you look over on the lower right-hand side of this chart where, um, so usually uh, you have a, a pretty big difference between how much it costs to borrow for, uh, for 10 years versus three months. That's the, uh, 
the orange bars on this chart, uh, when the relationship reverses, which means that it's cheaper for the government to borrow for 10 years than it is for the government to borrow for three months, that's a sign that financial markets are anticipating that the Federal Reserve is going to be cutting interest rates. Uh, and often the reason the Fed is cutting interest rates is because the Fed uh, cuts interest rates uh, at, during the onset of, onset of recession um, because the, the overall economy is weakening. Uh, and so if um, the... Uh, like the, the advisory board members and I can't really see it from this distance, but the student probably can. If you look at the blue bars too, there's this very narrow place where they invert as well, just for like a week or so in October. Um, and um, that is, so both the, the 10 year to three month interest rate relationship reversed what, it's usually, what it usually is, as well as the two year to uh, 10 year interest rate relationship. Um, and, you know, historically, since World War II, I think seven out of eight times, seven out of nine times, or, no, no, excuse me, it's, it's more like nine out of seven times that uh, the, uh, that, no, I have that wrong. You can't, you can't possibly be nine out of seven times. So, uh, it, it, the yield curve is inverted like this about nine times, and around seven of those times it's been followed by recession. So, a pretty strong uh, economic indicator, and often, uh, interest rates have a better track record, actually, of saying when a recession is going to start than living, you know, flesh and blood economic forecasters. So it's something that, you know, people in my, in my job take very seriously when it happens. Um, we are not predicting the U.S. recession despite this uh, in, in PNC economics, and the reason is that uh, at the same time that U.S. interest rates inverted, uh, interest rates in foreign countries have been a actually negative. So uh, if you want to... Um, loan money to the German government right now, and you want to have the German government pay you back uh, 100 euros in 10 years, uh, you have to give the German government 102 or 104 euros today. Um, that ne that's what negative interest rates mean. It means you, you get back less on your investment when, at the end of the investment period than, than you pay out up front. Um, and so that is uh, having a, you know, a big spillover effects on US capital markets, pushing down our interest rates, and if you, you know, think from the perspective of a German insurance company that has a lot of ex excess cash on their balance sheet that they need to invest and generate a return on, or a German, German pension fund, uh, those big institutional investors, they, you know, given the choice between losing money and they're sure that they're going to lose it, investing locally, or do they invest overseas and they have to think about, you know, exchange rate risk, they have to think about, um, other uncertainties investing far off in uh, places like the United States. But, you know, given the choice between definitely losing money and maybe hopefully making some money on a, an American investment, they're being pushed into these, uh, uh, into uh, American treasury bonds. And so that's one of the factors pushing down U.S. long-term interest rates right now. It's a reason why we think that um, the inverted yield curve is not necessarily a sign of, uh, of an impending recession. Uh, what it is, I think legitimately a sign of is we're, we're in a manufacturing recession in the U.S. right now. So that's really tough news for, for Michigan. Uh, it's bad news for Northwest Ohio, where I live. Um, and uh, and it's, you can see the effects both in the United States. Uh, so that, uh, what, what we're looking at right here, um, this is a survey that's released monthly of purchasing managers. So these are the people at a uh, company who are responsible for buying all of the um, the components of what they produce. So think of an, uh, uh, a car company, they, they need to buy all of their components and they need to have a, um, a window into whether purchases are, are increasing now or are going to increase in the future. What are order books doing? So that people who sit in that part of the company have a, a really um, uh, useful view of what's going on in their business. And they, they have, more, they have a, a clearer perspective on the near-term outlook for business than um, uh, people in other parts of the company that are, are, uh, don't see as much of their, those interactions with the, the outside of, uh, of their supply chains. So purchasing managers' indices, they, they take a survey of all those people, they aggregate it up into a, a single number. A number over 50 indicates that um, economic activity in the survey companies is, is growing, and a number under 50 in, indicates that economic activity is falling. And purchasing activity in the manufacturing sectors in the United States, in China, in the European Union, 
uh, in Japan. Uh, it's contracting. It has been contracting for the last few months. Uh, in the U.S., the Purchasing Managers Index uh, for Manufacturing uh, in September was the, the weakest that it's been uh, since the end of the Great Recession in 2009. So this is a pretty big deal um, for, for the manufacturing industry. Uh, and I think some of the effect in the U.S. is probably reflecting uh, a temporary drag on activity from the GM strike. And so with the strike over, that, that effect should come out of the data in the next two months. Uh, but I think the fact that you see the same trend, uh, not just in the U.S., but in these economies, which collectively are, are more than half of the global economy, uh, is a sign that, that there's something pretty broad-based uh, dragging on global manufacturing. Um, the, the good news for the U.S. and for the world economy is that the, um, even with a, a pretty sharp slowdown in manufacturing right now, uh, the, the labor market in the United States is, is really in terrific shape relative to our experience in the last 10 or 20 or even, even 50 years. So uh, the unemployment rate in the month of September of 3.5% is the lowest since 1969. Uh, the um, number of job openings in the U.S. Uh, reached a, uh, the highest in, in data on record going back to 2000, uh, uh, mid-year last year. So by, by many, many measures, the U.S. economy, the, the labor market is, uh, is doing quite well. And so that strong labor market is, has created a lot of forward momentum for the economy. Uh, when, you have, um, when the labor market is tight, businesses uh, raise wages, and they, they raise the uh, wages that they're offering to new employees, as well, to, as well as they raise wages for employees who already work for them to try to make sure that they can retain uh, their, their existing workforce. Uh, and that kind of market pressure creates more income for households. Uh, and then uh, you can, over time, that adds to a virtuous cycle where uh, rising incomes and increasing number of jobs for, for households uh, translates into more demand for businesses. Uh, businesses have more revenue, uh, more profits, and that uh, increases investment, increases their ability to continue to hire and continue to to raise wages. So we're, we're finally in the sweet spot uh, of the economic expansion after a very long and, and you know, very frustrating recovery uh, from the Great Recession. Um, and because we already have that quite positive momentum on the labor market side, we think that's the side of the economy that will continue to keep uh, the U.S. economy expanding and on net adding jobs uh, over the next 12 to 18 months, even though we have this pretty pronounced uh, slowdown uh, in the manufacturing sector. Was there a question? No? Okay. So um, if, if you look at what's happening in the labor market locally, uh, we have seen an uptick uh, in the, the unemployment rate for the, for the Detroit metro area uh, in the last uh, year or so. Um, and, you know, so uh, let me talk you through how I, as an economist, interpret these economic data. So. Just, just eyeball the unemployment rate, the orange line on the chart, the U.S. unemployment rate. You see pretty small fluctuations month to month, right? You, you have, and you have these very minor uh, movements around uh, very, very well-pronounced long-term trends. And if you're taking um, a data analytics class or an econometrics class, you can uh, kind of rigorously quantify how much of this volatility you're getting around the, the trend of what your data is. And you can... Give, give an exact number for how much signal you're getting out of these month-to-month -month fluctuations uh, versus, you know, the, um, uh, versus just the, the noise. Uh, compare that to the, the Detroit metro area, you see you have these much larger fluctuations in the data. Um, this is one where my dad would say you don't need to be a, a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing. Um, you know, just to eyeball the data, you can tell that you, you're not getting necessarily a, a real signal looking at those six-month fluctuations. It's, a lot of that is noise. So I'm not hugely worried by the increase in the local unemployment rate that we see over the last uh, 12 months' data. Um, I think the, uh, enough of the um, Mich southeastern Michigan economy is uh, really tightly linked to the overall U.S. business cycle that probably some of this is just month-to-month uh, -month fluctuation in noise, but I, I think we are seeing a reflection of that um, contraction in U.S. manufacturing coming to, uh, coming to affect us here, as well as um, the, uh, the, and probably also the, uh, the, some, some businesses anticipating a slowdown in the auto sector uh, ahead of when the, uh, the GM strike uh, was announced. Um, so again, the good news for the U.S. economy, household spending, the consumer sector in the U.S. 
Consumer confidence is excellent. Uh, we've had the, uh, the highest levels of consumer confidence. Um, in, in late 2018, we had the highest levels of consumer confidence in several decades. We're, we were close to that a little bit earlier this year in July. We've seen some month-to-month -month fluctuations since then. Um, but in general, the trend is still up, uh, although there's a lot of volatility around that trend. Um, and so that reinforces our view that, um, that consumers and households are going to be propelling the U.S. economy forward. Uh, another, uh, I think, very encouraging development uh, for, for the U.S. household sector is, so um, compare, I want you to compare where we are here today. Uh, and the orange line here is year-over-year -year growth in disposable personal income. So um, in late 2018, when income growth was peaking uh, for the last few years, we were just getting just over 4% um, growth in disposable personal income, meaning uh, uh, average, um, uh, the, the number of people working in the United States was increasing by uh, one and a half to one and three quarters percent to two percent. And then the amount of income that each of those people was earning was also increasing by a little bit over two percent. So you multiply the one growth rate by the other and you get the, the increase in total income earned. And that's what propels consumer spending in the United States. Um, so that uh, increase in income was outpacing growth uh, in consumer spending. Um, which uh, also increased over this period, by not by, but not by as much. And then slowed sharply at the turn of the year uh, when the stock market um, fell in the fourth quarter uh, and then subsequently recovered a little bit. The, the good news to me as an economic forecaster from these data is the fact that income has been growing faster than spending has been growing means that the savings rate is pretty high. And if you look back at the last time we saw a big slowdown in income growth, uh, in 2013, this is there, there was uh, a tax increase, you know, similar to what we're getting in uh, in this year. Where we, that was the, uh, uh, the the fiscal cliff tax increase, I believe. And um, right after that tax increase, right before that tax increase went into effect, you saw uh, savings rates jump um, because businesses pulled forward their uh, you know discretionary payments to to employees, bonuses, and so forth. Uh, and then you saw the savings rate drop sharply after the tax increase uh, as uh, that higher tax meant less disposable income for households. The, um, but because, um, because it was a one-off uh, decrease in income that, and the economy subsequently recovered, uh, household spending held up much better than uh, household income. And that's because savings rates were pretty high, and even with the drop in savings rates, households had enough cushion in their balance sheet collectively uh, to keep uh, to keep spending growing, and you know, look up, look here, we're back basically at the same level that we were prior to that uh, 2013 tax hike. So that's a sign to me that uh, household balance sheets are resilient enough right now uh, to keep uh, spending growing going forward. Uh, the, the biggest component of household wealth in the United States is is real estate, uh, and nationally, where real estate prices are back to where they were uh, in the the housing bubble peak uh, prior to the Great Recession. Uh, so great news for the for household wealth. Um, household, uh, despite that increase in housing prices, we don't think we're in another. We don't think we're in another housing bubble. The um, the mortgage underwriting standards are much stricter today than what they were in the mid 2000s. Um, uh, we think that the increase in housing prices that we've had is, you know, reasonably explained by stronger economic fundamentals in the United States, rising employment, rising income, uh, and very low interest rates, which make mortgages uh, more affordable. So um, this uh, growth in housing prices, which is solidly supported by the fundamentals, is, is another good support to household spending. Um, the uh, 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 household credit in the United States, so this is looking specifically at uh, unsecured household credit. So for, um, for people who are interested in going into banking or, or, or the financial sector or lending, um, there's a, a big difference in, in performance of uh, loans for secured credit, meaning that there's um, an asset behind that loan. If uh, uh, a bank uh, lends uh, $100,000 to someone uh, as a, a line of credit against their home, and then that borrower can't pay back the home, the bank, uh, the home is, uh, the bank is, uh, the loan is secured by the house, versus. Um, the uh, a loan that's made just on your own personal credit, uh, and the uh, the delinquency rate, so the the share of loans that are not being paid back, 
uh, is extremely low right now on household credit, another sign of the health of the U.S. housing sector. Um, delinquency rates for unsecured credit like this, they're higher than they were in the 2003 to 2011 period, um, but not, uh, not wildly so. And um, in particular, if you look at student lending, that we saw a big spike in student loan delinquencies in the, in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Um, but since then, it's been quite stable. Uh, so I think with interest rates falling over the last uh, four months, the Fed's cut interest rates by a quarter percentage point in July, in September, and in October. I think lower interest rates are going to be a boost for, um, for American borrowers, and, and we'll see improvement in, uh, in credit performance in, uh, in lending to the household sector. So uh, the not-so-good news. Um, this is the uh, monthly growth in uh, payroll jobs in the United States. And this is uh, one of the most closely followed economic indicators. This, along with the, those purchasing managers indices that I talked about earlier in my talk. Um, and here we've seen a big uh, slowdown in economic growth and job growth uh, over the last 18 months. Um, and this is, I know, a mess of a chart, but I, there's a, an important message I'd like you to take away from it, which is, um, so the, uh, the blue lines here are the data that were available to economists analyzing the U.S. economy uh, as of May of this year. Um, and the orange lines are, are the data that we have today. And so not only do you see a slowdown in job growth in the, the data that were released between May and the present, you also see big downward revisions in how much job growth we had going back 12 months in the past. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why um, economists notoriously often are not able to, predict, to tell you that a recession is happening until the recession is already underway, and sometimes until the recession is already over, which is that the statistics that are used to measure whether the U U.S. economy is growing or contracting often get revised down uh, over the course of, uh, of an economic slowdown. Um, now, even after these downward revisions to, to data over the last 12 to 18 months, still seeing pretty good job growth, and the job growth that we, we're getting right now is fast enough that um, it's keeping the unemployment rate moving down. The unemployment rate tends to be revised much less than the number of jobs added every month, so uh, that statistic uh, being at 3.5%, I think, is a strong signal that we are still in a very strong job market uh, in the United States. Um, but there is, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, a really high degree of uncertainty about what specifically is happening to the U.S. economy uh, in the last three months or the last six months, uh, and definitely in, in the latest month. And so all of the economic statistics that uh, you read about in the newspaper or I'm writing about in my reports, we should all understand that um, there's a high degree of, of uh, measurement error that, that we have to be prepared for uh, in using those data. Uh, the sentiment surveys are asking people how they feel about the economy uh, are often, you don't get as tight of a relationship to how fast jobs are really growing, but sentiment surveys also don't get revised, so I kind of like them as, as a better short-term read of the economy. Um, and on the business sentiment side, so I, we, we saw consumer sentiment earlier, how um, American households are feeling about the economy. This is looking specifically at how people running businesses feel about the economy, and that gives you a window into what's the outlook for hiring and what's the outlook for capital spending in the United States, because this is how the people who make those hiring and spending decisions are, are feeling about the outlook in real time. Uh, big drop in uh, sentiment for uh, CEOs of large businesses, and so that makes sense. You know, the businesses that have the most complex, most global supply chains are seeing the most direct effect uh, of tariff rates changing, uh, whereas uh, you know, the sentiment for small businesses is down a little bit, but it's basically holding up, and it's not far off of uh, the record high levels uh, the multi-decade high levels that we saw uh, in 2018. Uh, so, you know, net, net, you add all of those up, and as an economist, you need to give people a forecast or else you're not going to get invited back to speak again. So um, our forecast is that, on balance, we think the economy is going to continue to grow. We, we don't forecast a recession. We do forecast a slowdown because of the effect uh, of, uh, of uh, tariffs on business sentiment. Uh, on businesses' willingness to hire, on willingness to invest uh, in the U.S. economy. But the, uh, the consumer side of the economy looks strong enough that we think that uh, we're still going to see uh, moderate economic growth over the next couple of years. 
Uh, we had uh, the GDP report for uh, for the third quarter of this year um, that just just came out uh, this morning at 8.30 a.m. with uh, and uh, the first estimate was 1.9 percent that will be revised either to 2.3 percent or to 1.6 percent or revised we're not sure which direction but probably substantially uh, over the next couple of releases um, but basically fits in with this picture that we have of uh, we're going to see continued modest to moderate economic growth going forward uh, the U.S. economy will continue to add jobs uh, on net, which means that not only will there be, um, which means actually in terms of total number of jobs added or hiring for college students, the news is really good because there's a lot of uh, older people who are retiring at the same time that you're entering the workforce, and um, the, the number of jobs that need to be added to the economy to, to create demand for new workers is, is pretty low by historic standards right now. Um, but we're not going to see growth as fast. Uh, is what we saw in 2017 or 2018. The, um, so uh, one of the questions that we as economists are, are dealing with is uh, how much further can this expansion go? Uh, expansions, uh, uh, expansions don't turn into recessions. They don't die of old age, is uh, the conventional wisdom of economists. They, uh, expansions run into trouble when there's an imbalance in the economy. Uh, or they, they run into a, a, a bottleneck in, in, uh, in the economy. And one of those potential bottlenecks could be the supply of workers. Um, and so this is looking at supply of workers, uh, or the labor force participation by, um, uh, by Americans between the ages of 25 and 54. Um, and so uh, trying to look at uh, what's happening for people who historically they've um, they haven't been, uh, they've been out of school, most of them, and uh, they're too young to retire, most of them. Uh, and so this is a good measure of um, an alternative to the unemployment rate to see how strong the labor market is. Um, and you can see in the, the, if you compare the peaks in male labor force participation, uh, where we are right now, we're pretty close to the trend line uh, of labor force participation going back to 1979. There has been this, uh, uh, long run, uh, slow decline in the, the peak level of labor force participation for American males uh, at, at the peak of the business cycle, which is a complicated question why it's declining, but, but it's, you, know, you can clearly see it in, in the underlying data. Uh, for uh, women in the US labor force, there's a big increase in labor force participation um, in, through the, uh, from the, uh, the 70s through the year 2000. Uh, it's been largely flat since then, um, but we're now, we might be close to, you know, you could imagine there being a peak there. Hard to say, maybe we are getting to the point where, um, where of the business cycle where uh, we're running out of workers in the United States. Um, I think probably not. I mean, I, I don't see a lot of reasons why female labor force participation can't be closer to male labor force participation, so that implies a lot of room to move up to, to get, you know, for, for the orange line to converge with the blue line. Uh, and I think also the, um, a, a lot of survey data, uh, of surveys of people who aren't in the labor force or aren't working, show that they are looking for jobs, but they just don't see job opportunities available. So um, this, this matters for uh, economic forecasters and for the outlook for interest rates, because uh, the, the Federal Reserve, in setting interest rates for the US economy, they have to make a judgment call about whether the economy, how much the economy can grow, how much slack there is in the economy, um, and set interest rates accordingly. Um, the, the chair of the Federal, the Federal Reserve, uh, Jerome Powell, said in his press conference today where they lowered interest rates by a quarter percentage point, uh, we think that there's room for the, for the US economy to continue to grow, continue to add jobs. The feds had a project to uh, go out and do surveys of people who are looking for jobs uh, and has been convinced by that process that there is still a lot of slack in the labor market that has been missed by uh, economic statistics over the years. Um, so the feds interpretation of this data is that both of these lines can move further up. Uh, there are other economists who are um, more pessimistic and think that we're getting to the point in the labor market where uh, supply bottlenecks will affect the US economy. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, one of those things that we, we know we don't know the answer, it's a, a source of uncertainty for forecasting. Uh, in terms of where growth is coming from on the business side, uh, the really good news for uh, U.S. economic growth is that the housing market, uh, which had a, a tough two years from early, uh, from early 2017 through early 2019, 
uh, is now recovering. So um, this is um, my way of illustrating correlation uh, in, in economic data. So on the right-hand axis, you've got the interest rate on mortgages. And it's an inverted interest rate, so the higher you get on the slide, the lower the interest rate is. Left-hand axis uh, is, the blue line is, is housing sales. Um, and you can see as, as interest rates, the orange line here are rising from uh, early 2017 into the fourth quarter of, of 2018, you see housing sales peak and then drop. Uh, you know, higher interest rates, they constrict <coughs> buying power for, uh, for potential homeowners. Um, and that, that became a constraint on the U.S. economy. You know, since early 2019, we've seen a, a huge drop in long-term interest rates um, of, um, you know, at least a percentage point on, uh, on effective interest.